Hi, everyone. Hopefully you enjoyed your tea break. Yeah, I know there's no tea around, but uh, hopefully you guys made yourself a warm tea. And now we're gonna go for a plenary. Uh, we're gonna have Dr. Farai Charasika. Um, Dr. Farai Charasika is a strategy management consultant and development and specialist in public health. Uh, he's a medical practitioner. He's been working for over 15 years working in public health system across the African continent. And Farai has worked in the president office in Kenya, Sierra Leone, Ethiopia. He was part of the core health. He, he was part of the core uh, team that uh, set up for Africa CDC in African Union and establishment of Zimbabwe's first emergency operating center. Uh, he's a visiting lecturer to a number of uh, universities in the US and also in Zimbabwe. And currently he is an uh, advisor of the COVID-19 team in the Minister of Health. He is married and he is blessed with three beautiful girls. Uh, Dr. Farai. Thank you very much. Um, so, yeah, so today we're going to talk about, uh, for these next few minutes, we're going to talk about challenges in an unjust world. And please, by all means, um, do throw in comments, questions um, in, the, in the chat box. Um, we'd like it to be a little bit interactive, um, you know, despite all of us being far away from each other. So I'm just going to start with the scripture that we all know. Uh, John 16, verse 33. So I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So I'm going to let that scripture sink in a little bit. Let's pray and we're going to dive in and start. And so Father, we come before you today uh, just thanking you for the opportunity to be able to come together, uh, even from, uh, from distant locations, to be able to share the word, to be able to dissect the word, and to be able to encourage and uplift each other. And Lord, even now, as we live in difficult times and challenging times, we know, as you've said, that in this world, there will be trouble, but we are to take heart because you have overcome the world. And as you have overcome the world, and as we are your representatives here on earth, and so we are able to overcome as well. And so we thank you for these next few minutes of sharing, these next few minutes of uh, just discussing the word and discussing ideas that we would grow and that we would then have peace to be able to face the unjustness, to be able to face the challenges that are there in our world. In Jesus' name and your mighty name we pray, amen. Amen. So let's, 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 let's go in a little bit. So we know that the Bible is full of stories of people who have faced challenges in an unjust world, but in one way or another, they overcame. There are a few who maybe did not overcome, uh, but many of them, you know, the Bible shows us many uh, successes and many failures. And so we can learn from people who've gone through these successes and, and, and failures. And, you know, you know, I think when you're, in, when you're at med school, you're always taught to classify things, right? And, and put things into categories. So for me, as I was kind of preparing and meditating on this, you know, I kind of thought of two big categories. There are people who found themselves in challenges in the world, and it wasn't their fault. And then there are other people who found themselves in challenges, and they got themselves there. And it's important for us to always reflect. Uh, you know, when, when we're going through difficulties and challenges, say, how did we get here? How did I get to this situation? And sometimes it's going to be not your fault. And sometimes maybe there are things we've done or decisions that we've made that have put us into this place of being uh, in challenges. So if we look at some of our characters, so, you know, for example, Job. Job was uh, living his life. Uh, he was carrying on doing his thing. He you know, worked hard, managed to make a bit of a success of his life. I uh, was doing well, had children, he had, uh, you know, uh, managed to accumulate resources to be able to do the things he needed to do. And unbeknown to Job, at a much higher level than him, a conversation was being held. You know, and basically the devil walked in and said, you know, I, I bet you, God, I can get this guy to curse you. 
And God said, never, it won't happen. I said, I bet you I can do it. And so God said, okay, don't kill him, but you are uh, permitted to allow things to happen. And so we see that happening and Job goes through all these trials and tribulations, none of his fault. Um, a much higher level conversation was happening way, be, way above his pay grade, right? And so things started happening and this can happen to us in our lives. Uh, you know, things maybe spiritually higher level or administratively higher level or politically higher level discussions and conversations are held and suddenly you find yourself in an unjust world with lots of challenges. I'm from Zimbabwe and if you guys are following the story of Zimbabwe, most of the citizens of Zimbabwe have found themselves in the situation where they find themselves in an unjust and challenging situation through no fault of their own, but decisions which were made at a much, much higher level than them, political decisions, economic decisions, uh, things like that. So uh, oftentimes that can happen. Um, and it won't be necessarily your fault. We see some other folks um, who find themselves in challenges. Daniel uh, found himself being thrown in the lion's den because some people were scheming, along with his friends, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. The people who were scheming and had ideas and thoughts around what they should be doing. And so discussions were held at a much higher level than them with the king. And suddenly they found themselves, Daniel found himself in the lion's den. The, the three Hebrew boys found themselves, um, you know, in the, in, the, in the pit of fire. Not their fault. Circumstances, conversations beyond them. Joseph, we see the same thing. Uh, suddenly, you know, he has a dream. Some might say it's his fault for sharing the dream, but really it was just a dream of a young man. And suddenly his brothers planned, connived, found himself, found himself in an unjust world with challenges. Nehemiah. Nehemiah was in exile working for a king. Uh, his people were in struggle. Uh, they were struggling, you know, economically, socially, uh, politically. Everything was just going wrong in the nation of Israel. And it wasn't Nehemiah's fault, but suddenly... He had these heart pangs to say, but my people, my nation, something is going wrong. And then you have the other group, which sometimes will happen to us, is that sometimes we can get ourselves into challenges. So Samson, so Samson found himself in the wrong company, Delilah. And through that, uh, you know, she was able to find out his secrets and able to weaken him and subsequently found himself imprisoned and having lost his strength, having lost the power of his anointing, and now he was having challenges, his freedom, uh, being able to deliver his mandates, the things that God had called him to do, and that's because he put himself in a situation uh, that was challenging. David, great friend of God, uh, God called him his friend, but we also find him in difficult situations. Bathsheba he found himself in a difficult situation, decisions that he made, got Bathsheba's uh, husband killed, first child died, he was in mourning that a child had died. And that again is circumstances because of decisions. So, so many times when we are in a difficult, complicated situation, it's important to just, at least for yourself, know, did I get myself here or was this beyond me? And why that's important is, if it is, as a result of your own decisions, my own decisions, my own doing, then it's important for me to learn and reflect so that I don't get back into this situation again. It's always important to learn and understand. And sometimes it's not my fault, but again, it's important to reflect and learn what is it that was done? What is it that happens that can then help me to not get into the same situation again? And so, you know, some, some, sometimes the challenges we find ourselves in were created by others. And some we created ourselves and some just happened because we live in a fallen world. Eve sinned. Basically, trouble came into the world, right? Challenges, unfairness, difficulties came into the world. And they are there. They're going to be there until the return of Christ. And so, we must learn to navigate this fallenness. And even those who are not at fault are affected by our fallen world. And, you know, 
just like we learned from the scriptures, some of them can be man-made and some of them are natural. You know, we live in countries where corruption is rife. You know, that's man-made. Global warming, which affects uh, our, our climate and our agricultural patterns, man-made. Extreme poverty in terms of inequity uh, and lack of opportunities and access, man-made whether it's at a local level, regional level, or a global level, deforestation, which links to uh, uh, global warming, again, man-made. And with deforestation comes many consequences, which we then sometimes call natural, and we put them in the natural category. Actually, sometimes some of them are linked to the way we as people behave. So the hurricanes and the tsunamis and the weather patterns that we see, the droughts, right? And then there's things like COVID, depending on which conspiracy theory you believe around COVID, it could be man-made uh, or it could be a natural phenomenon. So depending on where you sit uh, around that. But all to say that at a very big level, uh, we live in a fallen world and we are going to face challenges we're going to face difficulties and you know if we talk about corruption a little bit because i believe this affects probably everyone on this in this meeting this afternoon is affected in one way or form by corruption uh, at a at a superficial level or at a very deep level and that's something where because of that we then see inequities we then see challenges in our communities. We see resources not being availed where they should be available. And particularly for all of us, and most of us who are from the healthcare sector, uh, we see what that does to, to, to our health service delivery. And so sometimes you are working, you're being faithful, you're a faithful servant, you're available, you're teachable, but you just don't have the resources that you require because they were not procured because of corruption. A tender was given out, it was never uh, followed through, or the tender was, was given out and things were bought at three or four times the cost that they should cost. And so the number or the amount of resources that made it to your facility, your PPE, your gloves, that made it to your facility weren't enough. And so that affects you and the quality of care that you provide. So all these can be very challenging for a Christian when you're trying to do the right thing and you're trying to be uh, uh, you know, upright and just and moral, but the environment around you is, is becoming very difficult and very complicated. But it's to take heed, as the Lord Jesus reminds us in John 16, that in this world we will have trouble, but we must find peace because he has overcome the world. So if we zoom in a little bit into our health system, because we come from the healthcare side, there are challenges, there are injustices, sorry, I should say injustices, uh, and inequity in healthcare. And again, as we're taught at med school, classify things, categorize things. And so we start on the patient side. Think of yourself as a patient, one of the people that you take care of. And it's important as, as a healthcare practitioner to be empathetic. Empathy just means being in that other person's shoes and understanding that other person's needs, their concerns, their worries. As we do this, we are able to navigate some of the challenges that um, our patients may go through. And so let's, let's be a patient for a minute. Innocent children get sick. We've all, if you've done all the rotations, you'll have worked in a pediatrics ward. Someone would say that's unjust, that's, a, that's unfair. Why would a six month old baby who knows nothing suddenly be diagnosed with uh, leukemia? Wasn't the child's fault? The child didn't do anything. Right? These are some of the injustices and the challenges that we find ourselves in. And I remember when I was a houseman many years ago, asking myself, myself this, these questions. But why? Why, why, do I, why, do, why do I have sick children in this ward who haven't done anything? 
And there they were, and I had no answers. But just to know that it is the way that we live in a fallen world, and that's, that's, that's how it is. Another thing that affects all of us, and again, if you're on a patient site, good people get sick, very sick. Pastors, our cell leaders, our loved ones get sick. But this person hasn't done anything wrong. They've done everything right. They've lived, led an exemplary life. And that can get, you know, that can be challenging for a Christian, for a believer to say why. And those good people can even die. And, you know, a few months ago on the Zimbabwe CMF, we lost a very dear sister who we all loved, uh, part of the CMF leadership. And, you know, it, it, people, you sit back and you say, but God, why? This is an example of a godly woman. It's an example of someone who's doing everything right. And, you know, many of us wept from the Zimbabwe CMF. We, we cried for her. We were really sad. And we just couldn't understand God's will, God's purposes in this situation. And to this day, I still don't have answers. But all we can ask for is that God to give us his, his peace. Because God is sovereign and we live in a fallen world. And it's important to, to be able to, to ask God for that peace because as scientists, the way we are, we always look for answers. We're always looking for solutions. And there are gonna be times when we're not able to get those answers and those solutions. We're not able to reason our way out of these things. And so we must be able to rely on the peace of God, that peace that surpasses all understanding, that, come, that governs our hearts and minds with Christ Jesus. So that's important. If you're a patient, and particularly, maybe South Africa is a little bit better, but I know there's some challenges, but even in the other African countries, but particularly in Zimbabwe, lack of access of quality care. That's an inequity where there are Facilities are unable to take care of you the way you should be taken care of. The resources are not available. And that's an injustice. That's an inequity that can our patients sometimes find themselves in. And this, it's, a, it's a challenge. It's one of those things that I know for many of the Zimbabweans, I'll, you know, I'll use a lot of Zimbabwean examples, even though it's a CMF uh, conference, because it, I think it helps to put some color into our discussion. And what it also does is that even it helps us to also appreciate the blessings and the benefits that we have. But oftentimes, and particularly even in South Africa, you will find that the quality of care is going to be vastly different from what you're going to get in Sandton and in Hyde Park uh, versus what you're going to get uh, in the Eastern Cape or you're going to get in the deep rural areas of Bloemfontein uh, or even just what you're going to get in uh, Kailicha or Guguletu, the quality of care may be vastly different. And so that's an inequity, right, which for a patient, they may not understand. They may be challenged. Why is this happening? Why am I not getting the quality of care that I require? And in Zimbabwe, it gets even worse because you might even be someone who has paid their medical aid, paid their health insurance, and you're still not able to get good quality care because you get to the facility and you're told we need 2,000 US dollars cash up front before we even talk to you or do anything. And so you fail to access. Even if you've done all the right things, you've, you've been faithful and committed to paying your medical aid, your medical insurance, you're able to fail to access. And this can be something that can be heartbreaking. And I, and I talk to many uh, brothers and sisters in Christ from the church, you know, they'll call because they're stranded and they're very distraught. I've got a medical aid, I'm current, I'm up to date and I can't get care. Why is this happening? And it's always really difficult to answer. And these are some of the injustices and challenges that sometimes our people may face. And then sometimes we are the cause of the injustice. Healthcare provider negligence. It's a tough thing to think about, but sometimes we are negligent. Sometimes we haven't done the right things at the right times. We haven't given the patients the best of care. And so people lose their loved ones. People are maimed. In, in public health, we call it morbidity and mortality. I'm sure you guys remember some of those terms from your community medicine days. Uh, morbidity 
talks about the injury and the loss of function and the reduced quality of life. And mortality is about death and the lost lives. And sometimes we are the cause for a number of reasons. Maybe it was a genuine mistake. Maybe we're working and we're distracted. Maybe we actually genuinely just aren't interested. And we're working, but really, this is not the place I should be. I shouldn't really be working in this rotation. I shouldn't be working uh, because I'm stressed out about my salary or I'm unhappy with government. And so I give substandard care. And sometimes that substandard care that I provide hurts my patients and might even cause them to lose their lives. And so this is a reflection for us that the challenges, the injustices and the inequity, we can also be a part of it. We can also be a cause of that inequity and injustice. And so it's important for us to reflect and step back and reflect on our own heart to say, am I also a cause for the patients? Am I a cause for a challenge? Am I a cause for an injustice? Am I a cause for inequity? And if I am, I need to take time to repent. I need to take time to ask God to forgive me. I need to take time to fix my attitude and to get my attitude right. Because the calling and the skills that I have been given as a healthcare practitioner are to serve and to preserve life and to save lives and to help people get the best quality of life possible. So if I'm not doing that, then I'm part of the inequities. I'm part of the injustice. I'm part of the challenges that a patient may face. Can I give us a few seconds to reflect on that? Just reflect in your heart, 30 seconds. Am I a cause for injustice, for inequity, for challenges? for the people around me. They might be patients. They might even be colleagues. Maybe I'm a difficult colleague to work with in the hospital. And people don't enjoy working with me because I'm moody, I'm temperamental, I'm difficult. And if that's me, if that's you, I'm gonna give us 30 seconds just to check our hearts. Listen to what the Spirit is saying to you. Check your heart, and if that's you, take this time to just Talk to God, seek that time of reconciliation, and make a commitment to do better. 30 seconds. My prayer for you is that God would reveal something, that if I have been a part of the negligence, if I've been a part of the creating the injustice and the inequity, at whatever level, as a policy planner, as a clinician, as a district health practitioner, if I've been involved in this, I choose to make a turnaround and to change the way I do things. So that in just that little bit corner of the world, that small little corner of the world, I can fix the injustices. I can help make things better for others. Just in that small place, I can't change everything. I can't change the world. But in that small sphere of influence, I can do better. So we move to the provider side. That's us as clinicians, as doctors, as nurses, as healthcare practitioners. And there may be things that are in, done to us that make us feel that this is unjust, that create challenges for us in our environment. You know, I look back and then you know, I was talking to some of my friends and my colleagues around how, you know, we're fearing I've been it's now at 17 years out of medical school. And you know, we're, we're just having a reflection with my classmates around how far we've come and what we're all doing. 
And if we were to do it over again, would we do medicine? Would we go back and do medical degrees? And it's interesting that about a fifth of my colleagues probably said they would not do medicine again if they were to go back and press reset, knowing what they now know. And so what that does is, you know, we discovered that it was a function of not having been correctly guided and advised during your, the days of your youth, right? And no one took the time to identify my passions, my skills, my capabilities. And so I went to medical school because number one, I had the grades. Number two, because it's something that my mom or my dad had always wanted for themselves and they couldn't do it. So here's the opportunity to see uh, their surname with a doctor in front and the surgery somewhere and show off to their friends. I went because it was the only option. I applied for medicine and engineering. Engineering was full, so I got medicine and here I am. And so with that, as we do that, it then the medicine from some, you know, they're able to turn it into a calling and, and a vision and a point of service. But for others, it just became a chore. It became a thing that they resent, that they did because they had to, there were no other options, but now their heart is not in it. And as their heart is not in it, uh, oftentimes they are then creating difficult environments for colleagues, difficult environments for patients. This is where some of the negligence then comes in because it's something that I'm doing was I need an income uh, because I was made to do it by my parents. But really, this is never what I really wanted. I wanted to do something else completely different. And so I become a part of the system of creating injustice, inequity, and challenges in this world. The other one is poor compensation. I'm sure if I was to ask, hands up, probably on, on the group, 90% of everyone who works in government will probably say, I'm poorly compensated. Um, probably true to an extent. And, and that again is an inequity on us because oftentimes we lay down our lives, we put ourselves at risk uh, in a number of ways, uh, we work long hours, we give of ourselves. And for some, it's not just the knowledge of medicine, but we pour our hearts out, we connect with our patients. Uh, there's a deep connection with our patients as we serve them. And that can be difficult, it can be taxing, it can be heavy. And so when you then look at your bank balance and you're not able to meet your needs, you're not able to meet the things that you require. And there's a difference between the things that you want and the things that you need. And here I'm talking about where you're failing to meet even the things that you need. And again, the different countries represented here were all at different levels. But I know for my Zimbabwean colleagues, oftentimes it's that you can't even meet your basic needs, your survival needs, you're unable to meet those. And so, and so what that does is you feel this is unfair. You sit in, and you go back after a long 12, 16, 24 hour call, you go back to your room and you're just upset. And you're like, this is so unfair. I give so much, I do so much, I try so hard, and I can't even look after myself. And that's, that's a normal reaction, and that's, and that's something that happens. And I'm gonna talk at the end about how do you deal with some of these things, because it's, these are real things, and particularly for the younger, for the younger uh, professionals. As you get older, your income will change, and you have a little bit of autonomy, and you can create your own pathways. But particularly for the younger professionals, this is a reality. And I've seen and I've sat with a number of young professionals um, who've even feeling depressed. Did I do the right degree? Am I in the right profession? I came into this profession thinking I could, number one, I could help others. But number two, I have a big family that I'm expected to look after. Everyone sacrificed for me to go to medical school. And now that I'm working, people are expecting me to help the little brothers and the little sisters with their tuition fees, with their school fees, so that I pull them along. In the same way someone carried me, I am now expected to carry others in my family, in my clan, in my tribe. And yet, I am failing. I can't even carry myself. 
and I've sat and prayed and counseled a number of young professionals who've been in this place of near depression because they feel it is unjust and it's unfair. And this is an example of a system that was created way above them, not their fault, nothing that they've done, but just the system that they are working in and living in is, 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 is doing this. And so that's something that can often be a challenge for uh, our young professionals. Unrealistic expectations. And I'll couple this with inadequate resources to do the job and do the right thing. I've been trained, I know what I should do, and yet I can't do it. My first, my first uh, upsetting event with medicine was on my second call, second week uh, on rotation. And I was a houseman, just finished medical school, been put into my rotation, second week. And like many of us, when you've just finished medical school, uh, you've got a grasp of the, uh, the knowledge, but not the skills, right? So your, your brain has been a hard drive. For five years, six years, you've been downloading information into this hard drive, right? And you're still processing it because many times we're cramming just to pass exams. But the skills aren't quite there yet. And that's why we have residencies and internships, is to then sharpen those skills, to, to move that knowledge into practice. And so, you know, the skills aren't quite there yet. And I remember uh, you know, an elderly woman, same as my mother, in the casualty. And, you know, it was in the middle of a strike. No casualty officers. And the nursing sisters called me, Doc, we have a patient. Uh, she's complaining of uh, chest and abdominal pain. Uh, please can you attend to her? Now, you're there, two weeks into the job, not quite skilled. You have all the theory in your head, but not quite skilled. And I'm trying to figure out what's wrong with this woman. She's complaining of, a, you know, took a thorough history, end up with four or five differentials. Now, what next? I need to do a number of tests and, and things to determine what exactly it is, because I can't quite tell. And you call your registrar, registrar is not available. You call the consultant and the consultant says, I manage the patient, I'll come when I can come. And I remember just being in a state of being distraught and, and saying, but God, I don't know exactly what I'm doing. I'm trying, I'm doing the best that I can, but I need my registrar, I need my consultant to come and really guide me here because I've got theory of what I think it is, but it's, I'm not quite sure. So I proceed to do a number of tests and some of the tests, you know, the basic labs come in, things are looking somewhat normal, a few things slightly off, but nothing major. Uh, and so I'm struggling, what do I do with this patient? And so I say, let me try, let me get a, 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 an x-ray done X-ray machine is not working. Okay, could we try a CT scan? I'm, I'm now trying anything that I can. And if you've been a houseman, I'm sure you've been in this place where you're kind of just saying, okay, let me try what I can. CT scan, can we get it done? CT scan, not working. Eventually the woman, I'm talking to the woman and she says, doc, the chest pain has gotten severe. It's really painful and she's crying. And I literally asked the nurses to come and give her uh, you know, morphine injection just to kind of, because she's now screaming in pain. They give her a morphine and she stabilizes for a little bit. I say, hey, Mama, I'm going to come back and see you. I'm going to go and attend to some patients and I'll be back. I go, I see three or four other patients in the, in the casualty. I come back, she's in a side room, sheet over her head. And we know what that sheet over a patient's head means. Sister, what happened? Pulse went down, no breathing. We tried recess. We lost her. Okay. Now I'm distraught. And, and, you know, when you come out of med school, you know, you've been taught all the right things. So this is where you're saying, I'm going to treat every patient like they're my family members. So I'm looking at her like my mother. I'm thinking, okay, this is someone's mother. This is like my own mother who's passed away. And I was really distraught. I was upset because I didn't get the support that I thought I needed as a junior houseman. I didn't get the resources that I needed. I needed an x-ray, I needed a CT scan. Those things were not made available to me. And I was really upset. 
And I remember that's the first and last time I cried over a patient. It's the first time because it's the first time I had lost a patient directly under my care. But it's the last time because I also then hardened my heart. And I'm not saying you should harden your heart. But that's what I did to protect myself. I said, okay, God, if we're going to be losing patients, I can't be crying every single patient because people are going to die. But that for me was the one patient where I realized that there's something wrong with our systems and there's clearly challenges, injustices, and equity in the world. And from that, and it's a long journey, which we'll talk about in another day and another time. That's part of what started my journey towards public health, more to start addressing the systems, the policies, and the administration to make sure that health systems work. Because as a clinician, I felt I could help a patient in the facility, but if the bigger system is not working, then even with the right skill sets and the right training and capabilities, I will not be able to, to train patients. I will not be able to attend to this patient and give them the best care. So that's how I moved into public health and administration, but that's for another conversation. But all to say that, as a, especially the younger professionals, you're going to do your best, you're going to try your best, but oftentimes the system may cause you to struggle. And it's these times that you just need to take a deep breath and just trust in the Lord and ask for that peace. Because in this world, you will have trouble. But take heart. Jesus has overcome the world. So as we start kind of landing this plane, some things to think about. What can I do? I'm in this big system. I'm in a big world, lots of issues. I'm in a big health system, lots of issues. I'm in a big hospital, lots of issues. I'm in a ward with a consultant and the, and the nurse in charge. Big issues, what could I do? Some questions to ask ourselves and to help us think through, just to help you know, us to process things. So you may not be able to control all the variables of the world, right? And that's a reality and a fact for us. Even a president of a country cannot control all the variables in the world. If we move out of healthcare, a president cannot control weather, a president cannot control um, hurricanes, tsunamis, and things like that. So there are going to be variables that are beyond. But we all have differing levels of influence and differing levels of ability to, to make a difference. You might not even be able to control all the variables of the healthcare system that you work in. And when I mean that, I say at the big level, so your Ministry of Health, even as you come down, maybe it's just your, your hospital that you're working with, or Chris Hani, your Baragwana. Maybe you don't even have control of that whole thing because there's a CEO in charge of that whole thing, right? Perinatal Hospital, Lusaka Teaching, wherever you are, you may not have control over that. But what you need to do is ask yourselves, where I am, where I sit, what can I do? How can I improve the situation that I find myself in? Ask yourself, what are the variables that I can control? What are the actions that I can take? So you may not be able to fix your whole hospital and everything that's there, but for the patient that is there directly in front of you, there are things that you can do. Are you providing the best care possible? Are you ordering the correct tests? Are you communicating with the patient in such a way that they don't feel or you're shielding them from the inequities and the and injustices? And it doesn't mean that we can shield them from everything because we can't, but there are things that are directly in our control. And particularly as you get older and more tenured in your, in your field, whether it's surgery, internal medicine, public health, occupational, whichever, as you get more tenured and as God bestows more responsibility onto you and more authority onto you, you get to control more and more of the variables. And so from, from that point of being a student to being a senior consultant or an advisor or a minister, or a policymaker, and everything in between, registrars, trainees, housemen, there are different levels of authority and variables that you can control. 
And so I encourage all of us as Christian health professionals that for the variables that I have control over, let's make sure that we are doing away with challenges. We are doing away with injustices for our people, for our countrymen, for our fellow citizens, and as servants of the king. The profession we've been given on is a serving profession. And we need to constantly remind ourselves that we are there to serve and make a difference. And while I cannot control everything, the things that are within my control, I will make a difference. And so I encourage us to take time and reflect on these questions. Those, you know, once every three months, once every six months, take time, reflect on these questions. What are the things that I can do? What are the things that I can change? What are the things that I can make a difference in? Very important for us. So practical actions that I can take to reduce challenges and injustice, injustness. I guess it should be injustice, right? There are some things that we can do. And I encourage all of us, again, remember we talked about we all have varying levels of influence and varying levels of uh, control over the system. On here are some very senior consultants who can make things happen in a ward or even in the whole hospital. And then there are students who you may not have a big voice, but you can make something happen for that particular patient or for a colleague. So number one, let's continue to improve ourselves and our knowledge, right? Part of it, remember we talked about sometimes the challenge for on the patient side is that, you know, they're coming and they're getting a half-baked doctor, a half-baked health professional who's not quite interested, who doesn't have quite the right skill set. One of my professors used to say, you have just enough skills to be dangerous. And what they meant by that is that someone who doesn't know will not tamper with a patient. Right? But someone who thinks they know but actually aren't quite skilled can actually be dangerous to a patient. And so we need to make sure that we have the right skillness so that skill sets so that we are not part of the injustice, the inequity, and the challenges. Let not a patient pass away in our hands because we were not skilled enough, right? And so my challenge is for all of us to improve ourselves and improve our knowledge continuously, continuously. We all have CME points and sometimes we do them because we want to learn, but sometimes we do them because we need to keep our registrations active. But my encouragement for all of us is that let us do them because we want to be the best and to provide the best service possible. Read about your rotation or your specialty. So if you're still going through rotations and you aren't quite, you haven't focused on one area, read about that rotation. Know how to help, know how to contribute to the conversation, know how to make things better so that we reduce the injustices and the challenges for our patients. And if you've already specialized, you've already picked a track, you're running down with it, continue to push yourself. Right? Continue to push yourself to be better, to be the best. It's important because we are to be the salt and the light, according to the scriptures. The Bible says that you know, we are to be the salt and the light, and the, and the light is not, is, not, is not lit to be put under a, a basket, but rather to be put on a hill so that all can see. And my encouragement for all of us is that we need to be that salt and that light so all can see. Let us be the light in our professions. And the way we do that is by being some of the best professionals. Understand and know the correct protocols. Know how to do the right things in, in your field. And if I go back again, I think about my houseman years. One of the things that, one of the weaknesses that we had, which has been fixed, is when we were trained, we were never really taught first aid. It's a strange phenomenon. We knew how to treat all kinds of things, but we've never really been taught first aid. So what would happen is if you're in casualty and someone comes with just basic first aid needs, basic resuscitation, oftentimes you're stuck and you actually don't know what to do. And so uh, take time to learn some of those additional things. Even if you were not taught, learn some of those additional things that are important. Learn the new trends and methods in your field. I always laugh at our senior surgeons, general surgeons in Zimbabwe, because you know they still do those, those big cuts. And I'm like, guys, there's a thing called laparoscopic surgery now, where you don't need to leave a huge big scar on a patient. You just need a key hole, a tiny little hole, and you can do that. And so people have had to relearn and retrain. And so as the world moves forward, 
skill sets are going to change. The way we're going to do things are going to change. And it's important for us to learn how to do these new things. The day of uh, big surgical cuts, you know, from the chest to the abdomen to the pelvis, you know, those days are gone. Right. Once in a while, yes, but now we, we've moved into keyhole surgery, laparoscopic surgery. And so that's part of learning what's going on. Push yourself to learn the new methods that improve quality of care, that improve outcomes. The other thing is to speak up for the downtrodden. So oftentimes we mumble and complain quietly in our health facilities. Oh, there's no gloves, there's no drugs, there's no machines. Sometimes this is known, but sometimes it's actually not known. And so my encouragement is as a group of doctors, write a letter, not an insulting letter, not a attack letter, but just a factual letter to the CEO, to the administrator and say, hey, look, we work on ward B12. And for this last week, we have not had the following drugs and we've had to improvise. We have not been able to go to theater for these reasons. I encourage us to take ownership and, and, and leadership on these issues because oftentimes, it's just people, no one is speaking up. And so the inequity and the injustice happens to the, the, the patients, but it's something that we could have worked on and addressed. So that's my encouragement, that we speak up for the downtrodden. We help those who have no voice. And then use data and information to advise and inform decision makers. So I come from a policy world, public health world, and we are very dependent on data, um, which is obviously slightly different from sometimes the clinical uh, side of things. But even if you're in the clinical practice, it's important to, to look and say, look, in the last three months, we've done X surgical cases and we've lost 10%, which is abnormal of these patients. The reason we're losing them is because one, two, three, and so let's see how we can improve the system. By doing that, we're taking away the inequity and the injustices and the challenges for our patients. So that's very, very important. And then of course, and on the provider side, it's also important to share some of the challenges that you face as providers so that they can be addressed. Now, it also, also like I said, it depends at much higher levels whether people are interested uh, in solving these problems or not, if they have the capacity or not. And, but it's important for us at least to speak out. We should speak out, we should make things known to leadership and not be shy, not be mumbling in the background. Very, very important. So as I wrap up, I want to leave us with some encouragement from the scriptures. Jesus tells us that, you know, in the scriptures that there is no temptation that will befall us that we cannot handle. And so everything that comes, be heartened, be strengthened, be encouraged that God will empower you and equip you to deal with that challenge, with that temptation even in this unjust world. And yes, during the time, it may be difficult. During the time, it may be hard, but you will come through it. You will come through it. And I want to encourage you, even if you're going through something right now, whether at a personal level or within the health system, you're discouraged, you're upset, you will come through it. And life is always about progress. And, and we, you will come through it. You will progress. You will move to the next level. So that's important. The scriptures also tell us that he's with us wherever we go. He's with us. And so take heart that even in the midst of that treasures in our personal lives and in different spheres, but they will come, but take heart that he's with us and he will stand with us. In the book of Psalms, it talks about he holds us with his right hand. And I encourage all of us to meditate on Psalm 91. As you walk through the, the, the words that you walk through uh, healthcare, some angels go before us. Again, the book of Psalms, we remind that the angels do go before us. They do clear way for us and they're there standing and they've been sent through to, to protect us. And we know that in the scriptures, it also says that when we declare God's word, the angels are activated. And so it's important that we are encouraged and we take heart. So as I close, I want to remind us that we will face challenges. We will face difficulties. The world is unjust. We live in a fallen world. But as we said at the beginning, John 16, verse 33, I have told you these things so that, so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. Guaranteed. But take heart, I have overcome the world. And the Lord Jesus will grant us peace.
governs our hearts and minds. Amen. So let me close with a prayer and I'm going to hand over to the facilitators. And so, Lord, we thank you that even as we go through difficulties and challenges in this world, with the injustices, the inequities on us, the injustices, the challenges and inequities on our patients, Father, we ask that you give us peace. Give us the strength to face and deal with those things that we can and give us the fortitude to carry through and go through the things that we are not able to change. But we put them in your hands and we seek your peace. We seek your hand upon us. And so, Lord, I pray for every single person on this uh, conference, online, who will watch it even afterwards on Facebook and in other media. Father, may their hearts be strengthened. That as we go through difficulties, may we always remember that you have overcome the world and you overcame on our behalf. So that, Lord, we would also be able to overcome. And so we thank you for this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So I'm going to hand back over to the facilitators, but thank you for the opportunity to share. All right. Thank you, uh, Dr. Farai. Thank you for the wonderful uh, message and the word of encouragement. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome back. Um, yes. So we have... We are almost at the end of our wonderful um, conference. I would like uh, to thank everyone who made it possible. And I would like to thank you all for being with us so far. So now um, we're gonna have a closing remarks uh, by Dr. Ryan, who's the chairperson of the CMF SA. But uh, also there are gonna be a a survey, more of a feedback about the, your experience throughout the conference. We'll appreciate if you can also give the feedback. And now we're going to have a closing remarks by Ryan. Thank you. Well, um, I wonder if, if just for a second, or you can just unmute yourselves and can we just give God praise by clapping our hands for a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful conference. Can we maybe all just clap together? Uh, that's only way we can actually do that. Amen. Praise God. All right. Sorry. Praise God. You can mute yourself again. We, uh, you know, on behalf of the executive, firstly, we just want to um, glorify yeah. God for his faithfulness. Uh, over these last two days, I'm sure you agree, we've had such a powerful powerful time of uh, uh, this conference uh, and we want to especially right now and appreciate the, uh, the the executive especially uh, Augustine and Hannes who spearheaded the actual organization of the conference together with everyone else but uh, we really appreciate you and your hard work especially and the team and uh, we want to especially thank all the delegates that have joined you know I, I know we we've had people from all over Africa and uh, and South Africa and all the provinces. But I just want to highlight uh, a young man who really touched my heart. To, uh, his name is Jeremy. And he is, he is joining us all the way from Australia. And it's past midnight there. And I was really, really touched by, uh, by him uh, joining us and his excitement, his exuberance. And I pray he, he holds on to that uh, love for Christ and that, and that excitement. Because I tell you what, and as an encouragement to all the students, as well as all of us, really, but especially the younger ones, stay connected. Uh, stay connected to Christ. Stay connected to each other. Stay connected to your leaders. Stay connected to CMF, uh, CMDF, if you're in Australia, or CMF, uh, Africa, Zimbabwe, wherever you are, South Africa. You know, uh, Farai mentioned that, but Farai and I, we know each other over 18 years. We met as students. We, we qualified the same year, uh, him in Zim and I, I in South Africa. And, you know, we, we've, we've maintained those relationships over the years. And even, you know, and, and I never dreamed. I mean, uh, I, I don't think Farai would have thought that he would be a speaker at a conference. I never thought I'd one day be part of the leadership of this, uh, this great organism called CMF. But God is busy making us. And God is busy writing our stories. So I want to encourage every one of us. Stay connected. Stay connected to Christ, his purpose, and to each other. Because that's going to be the hope for our nations. Is uh, our connection, our love for each other. And our love for Christ is going to bring the hope. Um, the, uh, the other thing I want to bring our attention to is I think there's a survey that's going to be put out. Please complete that. It's going to help us to, uh, uh, to see where we, 
where, where we can improve or what has been great. There, it's coming up on your screen now. So you just fill out the your overall evaluation of the conference. It'll take uh, just a couple of seconds. Um, and so I wonder if we can fill more than one option because you see, now the second question says, what aspect of the conference are most value to you? So, you know, if you want to fill all, I don't think it's possible, but just you can try and see how you can fill that out. But um, while you're filling that out, also I want to bring, to, bring out to our attention the, um, the upcoming Southern African uh, conference. So we didn't want to speak too much about it now before this conference, but you will be getting the details by our executive and our secretary and all uh, the social media platforms. It's on the 18th, 19th, and 20th of September. So the Zambian, uh, the Zambian uh, chapter is, of CMF is actually CMF, uh, yeah, uh, CMF Zambia is hosting it, but it'll be also a Zoom online conference. So I think everyone is free to attend. So the details will come, uh, will come out shortly. We will send it via our social media as well as the registration details. You will come out uh, through various platforms. It's on the 18th, 19th, and 20th of September. Uh, very quickly, if you have, if you've already filled out this uh, form, please submit, uh, uh, submit it so we can take the poll. And then just, just for us to close and please keep in touch, continue um, keeping touch with each other. And to, before, you know, as we're closing, I'm going to close in prayer, but I wonder if I could just sing that uh, chorus just one time. You can, you can sing in your rooms if you can with your mics muted though. Uh, but it's just uh, something that always inspires me, this old song that was written in CMF, I think the Durban 2008 International Conference. You go, you, you I, know Ryan, can I say something quickly before you sing? Uh, okay. Ryan, yeah. I Mickey, just thought, okay. you know, yes. you know, we had a, a plenary breakout session and uh, I think maybe what we should do in future is have some time for questions and interaction in all our plenaries and that kind of stuff. But I think what we've got from the, our breakout session we discussed is that we think, you know, with going forward that we should have more of these conferences to, uh, and maybe on a quarterly basis, you know, um, because it was very encouraging for a, a lot of the people that was in my group were from Zimbabwe and they were posting a lot of this, the struggles. So they feel, and I think maybe the executive should look at having this as often as we can, not just once a year, you know, now that we have the platform, you can discuss it. I thought I'll just throw it in there, Ryan, while everyone is listening. Okay, no, thanks, Mickey. Yeah, we, 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 will, we will consider that in our, if you have any other suggestions, you can send it via uh, your regional rep or, or just send a message to us via the CMF uh, uh, WhatsApp groups or email or anything. And we can, we can look at that in our executive meetings. All right, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Nadesan. So right now, we, um, before I close in prayer, I'm just gonna sing that chorus one time. Uh, bring your healing to the nation through our lives and through our hands bring your healing to the nations dear lord change our lives and change our land one more time bring your healing to the nations through our lives and through our hands bring your healing to the nations dear lord change our lives and change our lands change our lives and change our lands father we thank you for who you are we thank you that before the first blade of grass was formed on the earth, you thought of us. Like the psalmist would say, who is man that you're mindful of him? What are we, God? We're so grateful, God, that in your story, you included us. And Father, we pray, O oh God, over every person that has joined us over the last two days and all those that are part of CMF or ICMD or whichever capacity they find themselves. Help us to understand, O oh God, that you called us long before we were even in our mother's womb and you ordained for us to be where, right where we are. Father, we all have challenges and we know, God, that the secular world does not have hope. But we do, oh God, and Christ is our hope. And I pray, Father, that every day we would carry that hope. We would be sure of that hope in our own personal lives. And, oh God, it will be reflected 
wherever we go. We thank you for this powerful conference that we've just had. These two days seemed like we were in an, an eternal portal mm -hmm. and you've just ministered to us. Thank you for all the students that have joined. Thank you for all the doctors that have joined, all the allied, other disciplines, the dentists that have joined, or the spouses, whoever has been part of this, oh God. We th pray, oh God, that we all have received the word. We thank you for our speakers. We thank you for Pastor Dlamuka, for Farai, for Colin, and for the, the worship that we have had. And I pray, God, that you, O oh Lord Jesus, would let your word will never return void, but we will always accomplish the purpose for which it was sent. And we pray that you bless those that have delivered your message clearly and accurately. And bless all of us. I pray, God, that the word that has, that has fallen in our hearts will fall on good ground. And we would take it and we would, oh God, we would not just pray, but work as well. Father, we would do, we would do what we're thinking, what we're praying, what we've been convicted about. We will make a U-turn in our lives if we need to. We will turn around and correct those things that we need to in our own personal lives and shine for you, Lord. I pray that this, that every one of us will become the hope for the world, wherever we are, in our own world that we find ourselves in. Help us to be the hope. Thank you, Jesus. I pray you bless every delegate right now. Bless every one of us with our families and our vocations, wherever we find ourselves, especially those that are, they find themselves in trying circumstances in places. Even we pray for our nations right now as we unitedly struggle against this pandemic of COVID. But we thank you, God, that you have a plan. You have a purpose. Help us not to be swayed, oh God, by anything else. Like Peter, God, help us not to look at the waves, but keep our eyes fixed on you. And Lord Jesus, we will walk the waves. Thank you, Jesus. Bless us right now in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you all. Ryan, allow the attendees. There are still few people who have not finished the... Um... No problem. And uh, we can hand over back to Tabang, who can uh, Thank you dismiss all. us. Thank you all. Be blessed. Okay, thank you everyone.